exercise 18D types of stationary points. We have covered all sorts of different types of turning points, uh, and we've mentioned before that a stationary point is simply just the umbrella term for all those different kinds, so things like turning points, points of inflection. But then there are also other sort of variants of that name, and we refer to them as maxima and minima. If you have a big squiggly polynomial, as is in this picture, you'll find that you'll get lovely turning points. But our old definition of turning points were often things like it's the tallest point of the graph or the shortest or the lowest point of the graph. Well, technically speaking, they're not true. So, for example, this turning point, which has been labeled local maximum, it is what I would refer to as uh, it would ordinarily be the highest point of a graph. But the graph still actually continues higher above it. So we call that a local maximum. So it's a... It is kind of like saying it's the tallest point for just that small section. Similar here, if you've got a, uh, a turning point that dips down, it's called a local minimum. Uh, the absolute minima and absolute maxima are parts of the graph that are literally the highest and lowest parts of the graph. Frequently, unless we restrict the graph, the absolute minimum, absolute maximum of things like cubics and whatnot are usually infinity because it just keeps going down, 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 or up, 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 up. Uh, unless we restrict the graph and chop it into pieces, then the absolute minima and absolute maxima um, uh, usually are. The absolute minimum, absolute maximum can sometimes be found, can sometimes be the turning point, but we have to always double check to make sure if it is or not. Uh, so one of the ways to check if you've got an absolute maximum, absolute minimum is just to substitute the endpoints of your graph and that's obviously when it's restricted because you can't substitute infinity in there. Uh, but that would be the one check to see if you've got, if there's any maximum, uh, absolute minima or absolute maxima um, before you declare something is absolute. In summary, most stationary points and big polynomials will be locals. And then if the graph has been restricted, you might find some absolutes by finding the end points. We also can use a uh, stationary point table to indicate what, whether or not a graph is a local maximum or a local minimum. Example one, consider the function y equals one fifth x to the power of five, five quarters x to the power of four plus five thirds x to the power of three plus five halves x squared minus six x plus one. Find the stationary points and state their nature. This is a very large polynomial. So we need to find the stationary points for this. Um, so in other words, we need to go and do the derivative and make that equal to zero. So let's start by doing that. If we don't know what we're doing, we should always find the derivative. So we found the derivative and now we're gonna let it equal to zero. So this is a large polynomial. So we go, if we're doing this by hand, we need to do some polynomial long division. So we would need to find a polynomial or sorry, a value that if I replaced X with it, I would get an answer of zero. Because remember the, uh, the factor theorem, the factor theorem suggests that if I substitute a particular value in there and I generate an answer of zero, then that value will become a factor. So I would choose numbers that can fit inside six. My usual go-to, of course, would be the number one, because that's the easiest one to substitute in. Well, that was awfully lucky. The We've got a, 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 a substituted one in there, in each of those. Uh, one take away five plus five plus five take away six will equal to zero. So therefore, I know that x minus one is a factor. So now I can do a polynomial division and do a long division to find all the other factors. So now we've got to this step, we'll need to do another long division and find to be able to factorize that cubic as well. You could theoretically also try to guess a few other uh, factors as well, but we do need to factorize that cubic. Well, 
Luckily, we've now found that if I substitute negative one into that cubic, we've now got a factor for this, which will be negative, uh, in this case, x plus one, will be able to factorize that cubic. So let's go ahead and do that. So, so far now, our factorized polynomial that we've made is going to look like x minus 1, x plus 1, x squared minus 5x plus 6. We can also factorize that quadratic accordingly. And there we are. So now we have to remember why were we doing this? Well, this is big, why, where did this come from? So we did the derivative of that original function or in the in the question when making it equal to zero to find where the stationary points are, because stationary points are when the gradient equals zero. The fact is it was just a very large polynomial. We had to factorize it to make it easier to solve. And now we can find the stationary points. So these x values are where all the stationary points are. So we will eventually need to go and substitute those in, in just a moment. But it also says to state their nature, and this is why I do want to go and make reference to, uh, before we find the coordinates, uh, what the natures are. So to state the nature, what I need to know is I need to know is the graph sloping up or down uh, in between each of these values. So. So this is a stationary point, uh, stationary point table. What we do is we find the different x values, as you can see here. You'll notice there that I have put our stationary point x values. So there was one at negative one, one at one, two, and three. You'll notice there that they are in between all of the other numbers. What we're trying to see is we're trying to see uh, if when x or the value of the derivative uh, when x is negative 2, we want to see if it's a positive derivative or a negative derivative uh, to see what the shape of the graph is. So we know already that when the derivative is equal to negative 1, 1, 2, and 3, we get an answer of 0. So we can put 0, 0, 0, 0. Where did I get those answers? These ones here. That was the factors we just solved that. We solved when the derivative is equal to 0. So what we're going to do is we're going to find when the derivative is equal to each of these other numbers here. So when x is equal to negative 2, what does the derivative equal to? So so that equals 60. So in other words, that's a positive gradient. So, so far, my graph is going to look like this. And then 0 is flat. the derivative is equal to negative six. It's a negative gradient. So that means the shape of the graph is going downwards. So therefore, when x is equal to negative one, that is, as you can see, it's forming a sort of upwards hump. That's forming a local maximum. Then when x is equal to 1, there is the flat point of that, that it's gone flat. So now what we need to do is simply to substitute, we're going to substitute 3 over 2 into this equation here. We're going to substitute 5 over 2 into this equation here. And then we're going to substitute 4 into this equation here. And we'll generate the answers accordingly. So now that we have found what the gradient is equal to, so I took the derivative, I substituted each of these values in, I can see that when x is equal to 3 over 2, in somewhere in between 1 and 2, it's a positive gradient. So that means when x equals 1, you'll see it goes down, flat, up. That means when x equals 1, that's a local minimum. When x equals 2, it's flat again, and then it goes negative. And then that is, so therefore, it is a local, uh, in this case, it's a local maximum. And 
And then once again, for when x equals three, it's gone down before it, and then it's gone up after it. And so that is a local minimum. Because uh, So in case you forgot what the sloping line means, it just indicates that if it's a negative gradient, the graph is going down. If it's a positive gradient, the graph is going up. Where did I get these numbers from? I simply substituted these values for x into the derivative. Where did I get these values for x? I just chose any number that was slightly before each of these numbers marked in yellow, so that the numbers marked in yellow have got a number that's less than it, a number that's greater than it, and so on. Where did I get these yellow highlighted numbers from? I got them from the derivative uh, when I made the derivative equal to zero, uh, and I solved accordingly. The last thing we need to find is we just need to find the stationary point coordinates. So to find these stationary point coordinates, all I need to do is to substitute those yellow highlighted numbers into the original equation. So now I have found my stationary points. We could also generate this table of values and or similar results using our CAS calculator. And for complicated questions like this, it would be ideal to use it. Let's have a look at how I would solve it using the CAS. So firstly, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to define the function. I'm going to f math three, define f x and equals to the function I see on the screen. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Math 2, press the DDX button, and type in f of x into the brackets. And it has come up with my derivative. Then all I need to do is I just need to go back to Math 3, go to Solve, and I'm going to highlight, drag across, equals to zero, and I get all of my different values. So now what I can do is I've got each of these values, so that's solved, that's done all of that solving very, very quickly for me. So now all I need to do to find the coordinates of the turning points is simply to substitute them back into f of x. So I can do f of one, uh, f negative one. So there was that 383 uh, over 60. which hilariously I seem to have got wrong. See, I've written 173 over 60. Thank goodness we checked on the calculator. And now I can fix that up. That's embarrassing. So that is worthwhile using the calculator to check your answers so that you don't end up making horrendous mistakes and putting them up on YouTube. On the CAS, you can also, of course, show what the graph looks like. There is what my wiggly little graph looks like. It's a weird looking thing. And also you can generate the table on the differentiation table uh, on using the table of values uh, option on the uh, CAS. So the first thing you need to do is just on the little cog wheel up here, just go to graph format. You just want to click on derivative slash slope. So yours will most likely have that written, uh, unchecked. Just make sure it's checked. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm, first of all, I'm going to click this little X and Y. And what I'm going to do is, since my earliest derivative is at negative 1, I'm actually just going to go from negative 3, going to make it uh, end at 4, like I did before. I'm just going to do this time the steps being 0.5. So I'm just going to do little half steps. Uh, and what I'm going to do is click on here. And what it does, as you can see here, 
is that you'll notice you've got your normal y values. And then what it'll also do is that this y uh, apostrophe one, what this does is this shows you the table of values. So you can see x equals negative one, it's zero. A bit beforehand is positive, a bit afterhand is negative. So that can also show you the nature of the turning points. Obviously, this is probably redundant if you could just look at the graph. Uh, but I thought if you want to make sure that your table of values are correct, this could be another way to check those answers.